My dear respectful brother, Jazakallah Khairan, uh, I was under the impression I would only be the only person here <laughs> because I thought yesterday you got all the information that you need <laughs> and there was no need but Alhamdulillah. Jazak, I just want to say thank you very much, Jazakallah Khairan, for your commitment and your dedication over the whole 10 days. It's extremely difficult to get commitment from someone to come for one, two days, but for 10 days, it's an achievement, Alhamdulillah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and give you ajr. Uh, I mean, I was looking at the, the recordings and uh, Alhamdulillah, there's like close to 20 hours. And that's 20 hours after editing. So Alhamdulillah, I think it's been a good benefit, Alhamdulillah. And we can benefit and also Brother Uthman was saying he's in over 22,000 notes, letters, or sorry, words uh, in notes. So that's a, it's a good achievement, Alhamdulillah. Something good comes from that. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him and reward all of us. Uh, yesterday, I mean, whenever you speak about uh, the Battle of Karbala, I was saying to Uthman yesterday that, you know, especially when I was researching through uh, four or five uh, major texts, one is al Bidai bin Hayas, a fantastic text. Ibn Afir's version is one of the best by far. It's like one whole volume just on Karbala, one full volume. It's the most detailed uh, available. I, it's, not, it's not available in English, which is a pity. Uh, but it's a masterpiece. I said, whenever you, uh, whenever you read about Karbala, the Battle of Karbala, and you go across the, the oppression that happens, immediately just tears come down your eyes. And these are just reading it and realizing the zulm that was perpetrated against these innocent people, uh, you know, for, for, for no reason uh, apart from standing up for justice and heart. So we know that. And we know the crimes that were committed uh, against Imam al Hussein radiallahu anhu and his family. And there's no need for me to reiterate or repeat that. But uh, a few points I want to make. One is, after the, the aftermath of Karbala was, uh, and, and this is a correction for myself because I, I, I read uh, a narration which was incorrect. And because I was rushing it because uh, of time, I made a mistake. The mistake is that there was 88 of the enemies that were killed and 72 members of Imam Hussein's party. So that's a correction from yesterday. I wanted to highlight that, and it's best to make that correction. Uh, so it's seven, uh, 80, 88 of the uh, of Omar bin. Uh, it's, it's just the other way around. Uh, th th this narration was mentioned somehow in Ibn Kathir's work, and I I never looked at it properly. But he was mentioning it was week earlier, and I just looked at the the numbers uh, because time was limited. I just wrote the numbers down straight away. Uh, but when I went to the text today, reading it. Ibn Athir, Ibn Athir said it was 72. So that was something I want to correct. So when all of these people are martyred on the Battle of Karbala, and they are martyred, uh, 72 heads, 72 bodies. So 72 bodies are there, and 72 heads are taken off, and those, all of those heads are then sent uh, via different people to go to Ibn Ziyad, who is the governor of Kufa. Imam Hussein radiallahu anhu warda, his honorable head, uh, the narration says, was given to a guy called Khawla. And Khawla, he was given the task of taking this to Ibn Ziyad. This was like a medal for them, you know, I mean, it just shows you uh, the understanding of these people, how you know, narrow minded they were, how selfish they were, how they never had no consideration for the goodness of Islam and the goodness of what Islam stood for that the only thing that they were worried about was treasures of dunya you know and, in, in, and even if they submitted to Imam Hussein those treasures would have been them, theirs I mean didn't Al-Hussein didn't he said to Umar bin Sa'ad join me 
and he said, I'll, you know, he's going to destroy my house, Ibn Ziyad. Imam Hussein says, I'll give you a better house in Hijaz. And then he said, I'm going to lose all my wealth. Imam Hussein says, I'll give you my wealth. I'll give you the wealth from the Ahlul Bayt. So, I mean, these people could very easily would have, uh, you know, reap the rewards of the dunya and the akhirah. But because of their selfishness and because man in his nature is selfish, this is something Imam Jafar Sadiq mentions, which Qadi Ayad mentions in Ash Shifa. Abi Ta'rif al Hukuk al Mustafa, the book which I bought on the first day. He says that the nature of man is rebelliousness. Man in his nature is a person who rebels against goodness. It's in his nature. And having that nature in person, that's the reason why man is not perfect. And that is why Allah then perfects him and makes him into a better person. And this is the nature of these people. They want dunya, they don't want the, the life of the next world. And what Khawla does, he takes his head to the governor. At that time, when he arrives at the governor, the, the house or the palace was closed. So then he goes home. And look at his, look at his audacity. He goes home and he's happy. And what he does with the honorable head of Imam al anhu, he puts it under the wash basin in his house. And he had two wives. And one was a Hadri woman from uh, Hadramut from Yemen. And one was another woman. And at that night, it was, it was the woman from Yemen that he was supposed to spend the night with. And he calls her over and she says, what have you bought? Why are you uh, happy? And he says, oh, I, bought, uh, I bought the head of Hussein. And she turns around to, this is his wife. She says, men bring gold and silver to the house. And you've bought the head of the apostle of Allah to our, to our house. But from all things, now you, you know, you could have bought gold, you could have bought anything, but you bought the head of the apostle, the son of Fatima, to Zahra salam alayha, you bought that to our house. I mean, don't you have any fear? Don't you have any uh, a recompense? Don't you have any type of fear in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what you've done? And she said, I, uh, I leave you. And she abandoned him and he uh, went uh, his own way. Now she spends the whole night in that room where Imam Hussein's honorable head is. And there's a narration which uh, Imam Muhammad ibn Jarir al-Tabri mentions. And uh, Ibn Afir also mentions it in his tariq. They say that the woman said, Wallahi, has the head was in her kitchen, one narration says, or out part of the house, one narration says. She said, I could see light going from the skies, light nur coming onto it. She said, some type of nur, some type of light that was un unnatural, extraordinary, was penetrating the property and penetrating the honorable head. Of Imam. She says, when I looked up, I saw birds singing and doing tawbah or flicking, you know, fluttering, fluttering around it, fluttering around and singing and happiness. She says, when I saw this, I knew this person was unique. There's another narration, which is a weak narration, some of the ulama have said, but uh, whether it's true or not, Wallahu alam, Allah knows best, that Imam Hussein was reading the Quran, even in that state. Uh, again, whether that's, uh, uh, one of the things with Karbala, you have to understand is, there's a lot, a lot of uh, fiction, there's a lot of uh, sus uh, superstition, should we say. There's a lot of issues which are not fact factual. That people just uh, uh, narrate these events as legend. You know, just, uh, so it's extremely important that when we go, when we come across this honorable life, we understand what it is. So that's what happens. In the morning, he then takes the head to Ibn Ziyad. And when he enters into Ibn Ziyad's uh, majlis, at that time he's all in the public gathering, one narration says that the women of the Ahlul Bayt have already arrived. One of the things that you have to understand is these people were animals. They weren't human beings. They had no... I mean, for someone to violate a baby like Ali Asghar radiallahu anhu, they have no humanity in them. And one of the things that Allah protected was the Izzah of the women of the Ahlul Bayt. That is, that is a beautiful thing. That, uh, that was uh, like uh, uh, Imam... Uh, as the Mishri said, that, that's one of the limits that Allah had. That was a limit of the zulm that could be perpetrated upon the Ahlul Bayt was that the women would not, the women would not attack in a, uh, in a disgusting way. Allah kept their honor, radiyallah, wa radwan Allah ma'alim al And that was unique towards them. Number two is that the women are, uh, you have Nubab, radiyallahu anha, the wife of Hussein, you have Sukaina, his daughter, you have uh, Zainab, his sister, and other servants and women of the Ahlul Bayt, all of the Maran are in dirty clothes now. Number one. They don't have a veil. The veil's been taken off them. Their, their, their hair is open. This is the evilness of these people that, you know, 
uh, not only not only did they want to humiliate Imam Hussein and kill him radiallahu anhu and martyr him and inflict so many uh, uh, oppression upon him not only that wasn't enough what they then did was they stamped over his body stamp, stampede against his body with, with horses one narration says 12 one narration says 10 horses there's different narrations but that wasn't even enough there and what they then did was they continued and what was the what was the continuation was that then they looted Imam Hussein they looted his caravan they looted his they went into his tents where the women were they looted the shawl that he had the property he had the house the turbans he had the sword he had everything that belonged to him they just looted it like uh, you know barbaric people you know animals uncivilized individuals that you know even even the, the worst of human being has more civilization than these people you know because you know even non-muslims don't even behave in this manner there's rules of war there's rules of engagement there's you know there's 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 ways of when you fight someone you know you don't attack the women you don't attack the children you don't attack the tents you don't attack the messengers you don't attack the servants but for these people it was, it was all about what what was their purpose the whole purpose was what was to humiliate Imam Hussein. it wasn't just for a reward because they knew that reward would come from Yazid and the reward would come from Ibn Ziyad. But the funny thing was, these narrow-minded people, none of them got a reward. There was only some of the elite people amongst them, Shimar, may Allah curse him, people like uh, Umar bin Sa'ad, these people that gained uh, a reward from Ibn Ziyad. So the head Mubarak is, of Imam Hussein radiallahu anhu, is brought to uh, Ibn Ziyad. And Ibn Ziyad, he looks at it and he starts laughing. One narration says first that even Ibn Ziyad, when he saw the head, after all the zulm and oppression and the injuries that he suffered, after all the afflictions that he went through, Ibn Ziyad was even taken back with the beauty of Hussein in that state. Even in that state, still, Imam Hussein was extremely handsome, extremely beautiful. And the narration says that the Kufans narrate is that head had an extremely it had around it an aura. You know, some people have that beauty around them. When you look at them, there's an aura around them, some nobility around them. And they said that that, that head, even though Imam Hussein had been killed, had been martyred, he still had that aura that he was still alive. That's something unique. It, it was different from every other type of head that was there. He had many heads that were there. And what he does <coughs> is he has a cane, one narration says, in his hand, and one says a stick. And he begins to hit the lips of Imam Hussein. One narration said, this, I mean, this is the level. And it doesn't shock you for someone that could, for someone who, to curse Ali, for someone to curse Ahlul Bayt, for someone to curse the, the people where, I mean, the revelation came to their house. You know, the Prophet was from them. The deen started in their house. And he starts hitting the, the honorable head of Imam Hussein radiallahu ta'ala and who, and he starts laughing and then there's a sahabi called Zaid bin uh, you know, Arkam uh, another, there's another narration which said there was another sahabi uh, radiallahu anhu uh, there's different narrations he turns around and says he says move your stick away from that person for Allah for by Allah I swear I saw with my own eyes Rasulullah used to kiss that he used to kiss them lips these were the lips that he used to kiss the Prophet these were the lips that when he was born the narration is quite unique that when Imam Hussein is born, like his father, I don't know if you all know this, but Imam Ali was born, radiallahu anhu. He was born in the Kaaba. Sayyidina Ali was born in the Kaaba. His mother is a, is a giant personality in Islam. And unfortunately, people don't know nothing about her, which is, which is sad. But she is one of the most huge. She is the only person in the history of Islam whom the Prophet lay in her grave. The Prophet never lay in no one's grave. And the Prophet then gave his shirt to her as a kafan, as a shroud which he passed away. And one of the reasons that he did that was why? Was because he wanted to repay the favor. Now when the Prophet was adopted in the house of Abu Talib radiallahu anhu, his uncle Abu Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, what did she used to do? When the Prophet was called, she used to have a, a cloak and she used to warm the cloak and tell the Prophet to wait and don't enter the cloak, let me warm it first. Once it was warm, then she would call him and her own son, she wouldn't call him. She would only call the Prophet And that is what you call a love of an auntie. 
and then she used to cover him and she used to kiss him and love him and she used to make the Prophet feel as comfortable as possible. That is why when she passed away and her grave right now is in Jannat al Baqi, towards when you enter in, it's towards the left side. And if you ask anyone, her grave is right next to Abu Dhar al Ghifari, radiallahu anhu, uh, resting place. I've seen it, I've seen it myself, but you can actually see it even from the main road when you go to Jannat al Baqi. If you ask any of the, the people who are in there, uh, not the ones who are the guardians and the, not the <laughs> I'm not saying ask them because they just say no one's buried here. And I remember when I went to Jannat Baqi once and I said to one of the, you know, he's a Pakistani pretending to be an Arab. This is a, this is a very sad reality that, you know, people learn a bit of Arabic and then they forget the whole culture. You know, <laughs> and you shouldn't really forget where you're from. You should be proud, mashallah. You should have that, you know, that uh, honesty of being happy that you're from a land called Hind. A land called India, you know, a, a blessed place where the Prophet said, I feel the cool breeze from Al Hind. And that's what the Prophet said, I feel the cool breeze from Al Hind. And great Allah's awliya come from that land. Some of the most unique people that ever walked in this earth. So I said to this guy, he's speaking Arabic, and I said that uh, yeah, uh, this was neither Azwaj, neither the Prophet's honorable wife. So I said that, is Aisha buried here, radiallahu anha? And he said, no, no, no one's buried here. I said, who's buried? I said, someone's buried here. There must be someone here. He said, no, no, no one's buried here. I said, what do you mean no one's buried here? He says, you know, just go on, no one's buried here. And then, then I went to uh, the grave of Imam Malik. Imam Malik is buried right next to his teacher, radiallahu anhu. And they both write that Anafi'ah is there, and Malik is there, radiallahu anhu. And, and I asked him, I said, is that Imam Malik? I'm just teasing him. And his face goes so red. And I'm like saying to him, I said, what's up with you? you know, is, is there an issue that you're becoming, I'm only asking you where the graves are of the Imams. And then after Imam Malik, you have the grave of Ibrahim, the Prophet's son, radiallahu anhu. And Ibrahim is that child so unique that in one view, Imam Malik's view, which is narrated by some ulama, they believe that Sayyidati Fatima, salam Allah alayha, and Ibrahim alayhi salam, after all the prophets, they were the greatest of all human beings to ever live. Then two people, both brother and sisters, uh, both brother and sister was the greatest of Allah's creation after all the prophets. So you can see that, that understanding. So obviously don't ask them where that resting place is. If you ask any other people, they'll tell you this is Fatima, this is Fatima, the mother of, and her name was Fatima too. His, his auntie was called Fatima. His wife was called Fatima. Subhanallah, you know, it's a, it's a unique quality to have. It's an amazing quality to have. And she is such a giant personality. She's the person, she, and so when, when Sayyidina Ali was born, going back to the point, Sayyidina Ali did not open his eyes at all. When he was born, he, he did not open his eyes. And then the Prophet ﷺ came to him and picked him up. This is his cousin. And the Prophet loves him from day one. When he sees him, he, he falls in love with him. And the Prophet picks him up and looks at him and smiles. And when he's holding Ali in front of him, immediately Ali opens his eyes. The first thing Sayyidina Ali sees in this world is the face of Rasulullah wow. Imagine that. And then Ali lives in the house of the Prophet. So Ali is the one who's jumping on the Prophet, not Hussein first. First is Ali. He's, he's been, who's his, who's his mother, if you want to call it in one way? Who's bringing him up? Who's feeding him? Is Khatija al Kubra. Can you imagine being brought up in the house of Khatija al Kubra? She is such a giant personality, this man. Such a, you know, she, she's such a woman that from all of the Prophet's wives, the Prophet loved her the most. And Aisha herself says it in the hadith in Bukhari. Aisha says, Ya Rasulullah, you love Ali more than my father and you love Khatija more than me. And the Prophet smiled and said, yes, I do. Because you can't be like Khatija. Khatija is unique. She's the first Muslima. The first believer in Islam is his wife. And you know the wealth that Hazrat Abu Bakr gave is unbelievable. His contribution to Islam is in no way second to anyone. But even his contribution does not match the contribution that Khatija gave to her husband. That was something different because one day the Prophet came and said, I want to spend in zakat and I want to give money in the way of Allah, but I have nothing. I have nothing to give. And Khatija says, don't be afraid. This is my money. Give this. And he says, I can't do That's not my money. She said, it's your money now. I'm giving it to you. So that is the loaf she had. So you can imagine we bought them in the house of whom? The house of uh, Ali uh, of Khadijah Kubra. So the same thing, Imam Hussein is the one that when he's born, he the Prophet picks him up and the Prophet brings him right next to him and gives him his tongue. You know? 
Abu Bakr is the one who did what? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is the, Arda is the one who is the Prophet's mounting on top of him. The Prophet is using him to mount. The Prophet is sitting on him. The Prophet, is, but who is the one who is mounting the Prophet? Who uses the Prophet as a mount? That is Hassan what we say. You, know, you can imagine that beauty he had. And that is why one Rish even goes even further that they said, Ya Rasul, do you love Hassan and Hussein even more than their mother and father? And the Prophet said, I love them more than their mother and father. That is the love he had for them. And that is the connection he had. And that is the reason why when he starts poking the honorable teeth and the honorable lips of Imam Hussein, there's no Iman in him. And then what he does, he turns to he turns to Ali Askar, sorry, Imam Zan al Abidin, sorry, who was the middle. He was called Ali too. All three brothers were called Ali. His title is Zain al Abidin or Imam al Sajjad. And Sajjad, why? Because he used to pray so much. Now, I don't know if you know this. This is mentioned by Ustad Abu Zahra, Rahmatullah. Who's Ustad Abu Zahra? Uh, I don't know if you all know Pete Karam Shah, Rahmatullah, from Pakistan. He was his teacher from Egypt. His teacher from Egypt, and he he's drawn he's drawn many books on the Aim of the Ahl Bayt. He was a, he's a, he's a great scholar from Egypt, an, an, an Egyptian. He wrote a book on the life of Imam Zain al Abidin in Arabic. It's a beautiful book about the life of Zain al Abidin, and he says that the first Islamic university that was made was the University of Zain al Abidin. Because what happened was when Imam Zain al Abidin came back to Medina, he was prohibited to teach. He was prohibited to preach. And he was prohibited to hold any gathering. And this isn't his. This isn't the way the Aim of the Ahlul Bayt, you know, behave. It's in their blood to teach. So what he used to do is he used to go to the market, and he would buy 300 slaves, and he would take the slaves home. He would teach them, and then he would free them. And he never asked them to do jobs for me. You know, do this job for me, clean the house, look, no. He says, and, and they used to say to him, well, why are we bought this? You know, because they're like, okay, they're honored to be serving Imam Zain al Abidin, but when they come to the house, he says, so he said, you got to study. So he's teaching them reading, reading and writing. And they're thinking, you know, this guy is bought us, and he's now teaching his reading and writing. And Imam Zain al Abidin had taught them. So they said the first Islamic university, uh, unofficially, was the university of Imam Zain al Abidin. It was the first connected teaching, and from that was whom his student was who his son, Imam Muhammad al Baqir. And Imam Muhammad al Baqir and Imam Jafar al Sadiq, both father and son, are the teachers of Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Abu Hanifa ta'ala studied with his father, Imam, ja Imam ba Muhammad al Baqir, but he also studied with Imam Jafar al Sadiq. Imam Malik was also a student of Imam Jafar al Sadiq. And that's why I mentioned what, what Imam Abu Hanifa said. That if Nu'man never spent two years with Jafar, Nu'man would be nothing. That's what he, that's exactly what Abu Hanifa said. He says that I learned everything in two years from that man. So these people don't realize the unique ability or the unique quality of the Ahlul Bayt. Because they don't have the fear of Allah, they have no fear. So he turns to Ali, this person called Zain al Abidin. Again, I'm explaining more about you to, because I won't get this opportunity again with you. So as I can, I'll give you as much virtues of, uh, of these people because people don't know who Zain al Abidin and, and these people are. So he turns to Zain al Abidin and he says to him, who is that man? And they say his name is Ali, Ali ibn Hussein. Ali ibn Hussein. He says, Did, wasn't he killed? Wasn't he killed? And they turn around and, uh, and he kept quiet. He says, I'm asking you, don't you speak? He says, and Imam Zain al Abidin says, that was my brother that you killed. That was my brother and he laughed. He just laughed. And he said, oh, that was a punishment from Allah. For death comes. And then he says to him, he, he's waiting for a reply. Look at the reply from Imam Zain al-Abadeen. He says that he died and that's a good thing. Imam Zain al-Abadeen turns around and says, death comes to us all. It was the decree of Allah. And we submit to the decree of Allah. And you can imagine how emotional he was. That he could have said a lot of things. And then Ibn Ziyad says, kill him. I think he's matured, kill him. And uh, he orders one of the people to again violate and kill him. And that's when Sayyidah say Zainab sallallahu alayhi she then hugs him and says, she says that I, I swear by Allah that no one will touch him. You've killed my 
You've killed my brother, you've killed my nephews, you've killed all my family. I have no one left, I have no male left with me. Who will take me to Medina? Who will be my mahram to Medina? Who will travel with me? She said that if you have to kill him, then kill me first. And that's when Ibn Ziyad left them. Then Ibn Ziyad sends them to Damascus now. And there's many narrations about what happens in Damascus uh, regarding the information. One narration says that when the information arrives to Yazid, he's upset. One narration says. One narration says he shows remorse. There's, you know, there's different narrations. But the thing is, with these narrations, and what, what some people do, i.e. those people who try to defend Yazid, they try to use these narrations to substantiate, to show that Imam, that Yazid was against the killing of Hussein. But what you have to do is, when you have these narrations, you have to look at not just two narrations, you have to take those two narrations and take all the narrations that are available, which are authentic, and then look at all of those narrations in the right authentic light, as a scholar, as a muarrik, as a historian. The easy thing is to do is just take one narration and just quote the narration. But if you look at every narration which was narrated about the incidents in Damascus, actions speak louder than words. His actions don't show a person who's remorse. His actions show what? His actions show an arrogant man. Show a, a person who's, who's not upset. One of the reasons why he is upset because now he realizes what? He realizes that till the day of judgment, this ummah will be cursing me. He says the Muslims will hate me. And, and that's not a doubt. Who are the two most hated personalities in Islam? In Islamic history, Two of the most hated personalities are Yazid and Hajjaj bin Yusuf. Whenever you mention a name, does anyone say anything good about Yazid? No one says anything good. Whenever you mention Hajj, Hajjaj is such an evil man. He murdered over 120,000 Muslims at one time. You know, can you imagine the, the first mass murder of the Muslims, Hajjaj bin Yusuf. That's his title. And the ulama said that if you got a, a hundred hypocrites together and you put them all together, there would still not be worse than Hajjaj. Hajjaj would be even worse than all of them. A hundred munafiks on one time, on one side. That is who he, this man is. Then you have the incident, another narration which uh, Imam Mahmoud Alus al Baghdadi, alayhi, the great Imam, he's say he's been from the Ahlul Bayt too. You know, a very famous tafsir called Ruhul Mani. It's an extremely famous, mashur tafsir of the Quran. And he obviously was of the opinion that Yazid did fall out of the fall of Islam. He narrates a few incidents which I want to share. He says, firstly, what Yazid did was when the news came to him uh, from the messenger that Imam Hussein had been martyred, immediately he praised Allah and he was happy. He was extremely joyful. He then called for a certain number of days of celebration in Damascus to celebrate the death of Hussein radiallahu anhu. Astaghfirullah. Then he began to drink more alcohol and indulge in more indulges that he used to indulge in. There was no remorse at all in him. And even to such an extent that when Imam Hussein's head was brought to him inside Damascus in his gathering, again he was even pointing at the lips of Imam Hussein. So the question is, if he had any regret, why did he behave in such a way? One narration says that he sent them back to Medina, which they did go back to Medina. And Imam Zain al Abidin went back with them to Medina, and the convoy went back. He gave them money, uh, but it's cheap giving money. You know, what, what, you know, uh, what does it mean? Because we know from Baytul Mal, you know, the, the money of the Muslims, the bank of the Muslims. Certain people have a right to that money. The poor have a right to it. The miskeen have a right to it. The members of the Ahlul Bayt have an allowance from that. For example, at the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, Umar used to have a, an, 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 an allowance that he used to give monthly to the Sahaba that participated in Badr and the ones who participated in Uhud. Their allowance was more than other ones. So we know the Baytul Mal was kept for that. So what they were getting wasn't, because, wasn't from Yazid, it was from the Muslims. It was from the wealth of the Muslims. And Yazid thought that he could just give this money to them. And then what Yazid says is he apologized. Look at me this. He's apologizing to Zainab radiallahu anha. And he's saying to uh, Imam Zain al-Abadeen, I never ordered the killing of Hussein radiallahu anhu. This is what he's saying. And immediately when they go, look at his actions now. Uh, you know, 
Again, they say actions speak louder than words. So look, let's look at his actions. Do his actions look and do his actions show us a man that's remorse? It doesn't show us that he's remorse. What is the second thing that he does? The second biggest zulum that he does is he orders Muslim bin Uqba. Initially he wrote a letter. But just to finish one point, after he did that, the, the head, the, all of the head, uh, the, one narration says, there are three narrations now about where Imam Hussein's head is. One narration says that it was buried in Karbala along, uh, alongside his honorable uh, body. That's a narration predominantly that the Shia follow. Predominantly they accept that opinion. Another narration says that his head went to Cairo. And a lot of the Egyptian ulama adhere to that. Even in Cairo you go opposite uh, Khan Yunus, Khan Khalil, which is, a, which is an open market, right opposite the Azhar Mosque, Al Azhar Sharif. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I've been there many times. It's a beautiful, it's, it's a very spiritual place. One narration is that his head Mubarak was there. The most authentic narration is what? That his head Mubarak went back to Jannat al Baqi. <laughs> and say that Zainab took him back and she buried him in Jannat al Baqi. So there are three aqwal in regards to that. And we realize that uh, in, in, in regards to uh, what they do. So one narration is what? It was buried in Karbala. One narration was that the honorable head was taken to uh, Medina al Manawara. And one was that it was in Egypt. So these are different variations of narrations that have been narrated by these people. So now let's look at what he does. After he orders the killing of Imam Hussein and he did whatever he did, let's look at his actions now. The first thing that Yazid does, the first ultimate thing he does, he writes a letter to Ibn Ziyad. Now, let me put it one way to you. If you do something wrong, you apprehend a person. The job of a person is, you know, and we know from the narrations when someone would do something against the Muslims, if he was a governor, Umar would remove him from his post. Umar is, uh, and you should all study his life. I would recommend you all to buy any book on the life of Umar. He's, he's one of the giant and great personalities of Islam. If you want to really study justice and adal, and you want to know how Islam is just, and how Islam is, 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 is a beautiful system, you have to study life of Umar. Umar sets a high standard, a very high standard, and, every, and anyone that came after him could never fulfill that standard. It was such a high standard of the Allah uh, Such a beautiful standard. So, you know, if you look at his actions as a person, you see, he doesn't remove Ibn Ziyad from his position. He doesn't apprehend him. He doesn't arrest him. He doesn't play blood money towards the Shuhada. The 72 members of the Shuhada from Karbala, he doesn't play, pay no blood money. He doesn't compensate them. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't uh, humiliate Ibn Ziyad. In fact, what he does, he promotes Ibn Ziyad. Now that isn't a sign of a man who has remorse. If he really had remorse for the killing of Imam al-Hussein, he would have done something, but he never. What does he do? He then writes a letter to Ibn Ziyad. And he says to Ibn Ziyad, I want you now to go to Medina al Manawara, and I want you to fight in Medina. And go to Medina, al Manawara. Give them three days to make the bayah to me. If they refuse to give the bayah, you can do anything in three days. It's halal upon you. Do whatever you want to, but make sure you teach them a lesson and subjugate the people to me. Ibn Ziyad, when he gets the letter, even Ibn Ziyad now has shame. He says, "I will not do this for this disgusting fajr." One narration says. One narration says, I will not do this for this fasting. I will not do one of this sin. I've already killed the son of the Prophet, he said. Ibn Ziyad said, I've already killed the son of the Prophet. I'm not going to go now and attack Medina. That was like a red line for him. So what does he do? He sends an army under the leadership of Muslim bin Uqba, one of his generals. He comes into Medina. He gives them. Because in Medina, you have people, Abdullah bin Hanzala, radiallahu anhu, the Sahabi. Very famous Sahabi, Abdullah bin Hanzala. Who is Abdullah bin Hanzal? Can anyone remember him? He is the one that when he passed away, no one did his ghusl, but the angels gave it. The angels gave his ghusl. And Abdullah bin Hanzal is that Sahabi that when he went to Damascus to meet Yazid, he came back and they said to him, Oh, what did you think of Yazid? He says, I swear by Allah that man's cursed. He says, I thought that Allah was going to rain upon us, 
you know, uh, rocks from the heavens of fire. Rocks that are on fire from the heavens. They said, why? He says, don't you know he believes in the nikah that he marries a woman and then he marries her mother and then he marries her sister. And you know in Sharia, it's in the Quran, if you marry one, if you marry, I married to my wife, as long as I married to my wife, I cannot do nikah with her sister, it's haram. If I divorce my wife or my wife passes away, then my nikah is permissible with her. But you can't, and that's the that's same with the mother. Yazid was the man that used to do nikah with a person, the woman, then he would do nikah with the mother, and then do the nikah with the, you know, clear contradiction of the Sharia. Clear contradiction of the sin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is the reason why Imam Rus al-Baghdadi rahmatullahi says, he says that when you make the halal into haram, you become a kafir. Based upon that, Yazid is not Muslim. That was his ruling. Another ruling that he gave was that when, when Yazid fulfilled the killing, what did Yazid say? I forgot to mention this. It's Mukhtarif narrations. He says, today I have avenged the day of Badr. He says, I wish my forefathers were alive today. For if they were alive today, they would have been happy. For I, the son of Abu Sufyan, his grandfather, I have avenged the day of Badr. A'udhu Billah. Imam al husni Baghdadi says, based on that, he's a kafir. Ibn Hajar Skalani says, based upon that, that is the reason why the ulama called him a non-Muslim. There's different variations of that. So they come there, Abdullah bin Hanzala has mentioned this point. The Muslims refused to give bayah. What did they do? He comes to Madinah al Manawara. I'm going to con uh, uh, conclude soon, inshallah. What did he do? He comes to Madinah al Manawara and he says to the people, give bayah, they refuse to give bayah. For three days, there was no adhan in the Prophet's masjid. Allah Masa was mentioning today in the Jum'ah. For three days, there was no adhan. There was one guy called Sa'ad bin Musayyib. Who is Sa'ad bin Musayyib? He is amongst one of the senior of the Tabi'een. And he was a student of Aisha radiallahu anha. He studied with Ibn Abbas. He narrated the hadith from Ibn Abbas. In fact, he narrated the hadith from well over 50 Sahaba. If you look at any book on Asma Rijal and come across the name Sa'ad bin, Sa bin Musayyib, it will give you a list of all the Sahaba that he directly took hadith from. He's a strong Sahaba. He's a strong Tabi'i. He says that when they come into Madinah al Manawara's masjid, he says, I pretend to act like a madman. So that they would leave me, I'm scared for my life. When they see him, the soldiers say, he's a madman, leave him in the masjid. He says, I am the only one for three days, I am the only one that's allowed in the masjid. He says, what do I see? He says, in the masjid, I see that the member that the Prophet used to stand on and give the khutbah. The member that Umar, that Abu Bakr would stand on. The member that Umar would stand on. The member that Uthman would stand on. The member that Ali radiallahu anhu wa radwan allahu alim al upon all of them would stand on. He says, I found the urination of the animals and the discreet of the animals on that member. Imagine even a normal member here in this masjid. Can you imagine if God forbid we someone allowed a dog in this masjid right now and that dog was to do something on the member, what would you do to such a person? You would probably kill the person, you would probably hit him. You, you would behave in a way which would not be nice. You wouldn't call the person a good person, would you? That if you bought, so can you imagine I'm bringing the animals on horses in the masjid of the Prophet? And that urination got so close to even the road of the Prophet. Feces were there. This, you know, you know, unbelievable, disgusting things were left in the masjid. He says, For three days I never heard the Adhan. They, they prohibited anyone to give the Adhan. Sa'ad bin Musayyib says, Wallahi, I used to hear that. He says, I never knew when the Namaz Salah was. He says, I never knew because I never left the masjid. All I was hearing was screams and crying in Medina. He says, I've never heard in my life that scare. He says, that screaming was so scary. I've never heard it. It frightens people. Why? Because that for three days, they were killing people, killing people. Medina had blood up to its knees. Can you imagine? 51 years earlier, Medina is a city that the Prophet was teaching. 51 years earlier, the Prophet ﷺ is sitting there teaching his Sahaba and the Sahaba Umar is there. Could you imagine? Could you ever imagine there would come a day after Umar or after Ali or the Sahaba that Medina would have blood up to its knees? You could never imagine it. And it's up to its knees high. Sa'ad bin Musayyim says, I don't even know what time the Zohar or Asr or Maghrib or Isha is. He says, when did I knew or how did I knew it was time for Salah? He said, I used to hear the Adhan directly from the road of the Prophet 
Directly from the Prophet's road, I would eat Agon. Then I knew the Salah, then I used to pray. That is, that, that is the, one of the miracles of the Prophet وسلم, and, what, and look what he did. And what did the Prophet say in the Hadith of Sahih? It's in Sahih Muslim. It's in where? Not a weak Hadith, it's an authentic Hadith. The Prophet said, those who frighten Medina, the people of Medina, may Allah will frighten them on Yom Al-Qiyamah. The people who frighten the Ali Medina, the people of Medina, Allah will that's why what did they teach you? What did what did the uh, Ar-Razi says in his tafsir? Ar-Razi on the uh, on the surah what do how what layli ida saja on that very surah Ar-Razi gives a tafsir. He mentions a unique point of understanding. He says you are walking and you come across a shoelace. You come across what? That shoelace touched the shoes and the sandals of the Prophet. It never touched the Prophet, it touched what? The sandals. Imam Razi says showing disrespect to that shoelace means that you become a non Muslim. Look at the Imam who's saying this? Ar Razi. Not me. Ar Razi is a giant Imam, a great scholar. This is the adab, the respect you have even to the shoelaces that don't belong to the Prophet but just touch his honorable shoes. They don't even touch his feet. You, you see, that, that is the adab you have for that. And look at the adab that this man has. The Prophet said what in another hadith? He said, those who scare the people of Medina, Allah's la'ana is upon them. Those who scare the people of, of Medina, he will be in hellfire. So who ordered all of that? Who ordered it? Could you imagine? 1,000 women were raped on that day in Medina Manawara. One, it's never happened in the history of Islam. It's a challenge. Look at the history of Islam from wherever the Zulam happened against the Muslims in Baghdad or anywhere. Nothing like this ever happened in Medina, either before it or after it. No, no, no fear of Allah. Ibn Kathir mentions very clear. Ibn Kathir says one. He says one year later, one thousand illegitimate children were born in Medina and Nawra. This and who were these women? They were not normal women. These were the wives of the Sahaba. These were the daughters of the Sahaba. So you tell me, if such a person could do such a evil act and he ordered it, and there's no doubt this is the funny thing. Not a funny thing, but this is a unique thing that Allah protected. On Imam Hussein, they, 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 they bring or there's doubt. He never did it. Finally, no problem. Let's even let's even leave that for a, for a, for a moment. Does anyone in the historians, does any single historian deny that Yazid ordered the attack of Madin and Hur, the battle Hur Rasul call it? Did he, did he deny? None of the scholars said Yazid ordered it. And he gave the order. So you tell me, if a person could behave in such a disgusting manner with his soldiers who are apparently Muslims and say that you can do this dhulam in the city of the Prophet in the city of Noor, the city of light. And remember, Medina is that place which contains Jannah. It's greater than even the Kaaba. The narration is clear. On Yom Al Qiyamah, the Kaaba will be destroyed. Al Haram will be destroyed. Mecca will be destroyed. Medina will be destroyed. The only part that will not be destroyed will be the Rauda of the Prophet. Ila Riyadul Jannah. That is Mutafukun Alayk on all the ulama. All the ulama disagree on that. That's why Medina has a greater fada'il than even Mecca. <laughs> that is why the ulama prefer going to Medina. Obviously, 100,000 prayers in one place in Mecca. You know, that's another issue. That's about praying. But in fadila, in, 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 in greatness, that's why the Prophet said what? He says, Oh Allah, bless this city more than Medina. And that's when, when Fatul Mecca happened in the 8th Hijri. The Ansar was like, well, the Prophet is going to leave us now. The Prophet said, I will never leave you. I will be buried. I will, I will live with you. I migrated with you. And he lived in Medina. And the wisdom behind that, why did he stay in Medina? So that people could visit Medina and Munawara then. People would, and that's why people go in the millions. So you tell me someone who behaved in such a way. How can you, in any right mind, praise him? Or attempt to defend him? I came across a book by a person, I don't want to mention his name, but it's like, uh, he, he mentions all the tribulations of Karbala. 
And then when it comes to Yazid, he starts mentioning doubtful things. Or he had remorse and was like, I'm like, why did you mention such a thing? What is the intention behind you doing such a thing? So you see this form of what we call Nasbism. Nawasib, we call it. Nawasib is what? It's a form of having hatred towards the Prophet's family. People hide it in them. People don't expose it to other people. They hide that hatred for Ahlul Bayt in them. That when you mention their names, you can see the fire and you can see how they become agitated a bit. They become a bit uh, uncomfortable. It's an unfortunate reality. And it's something that Yazid himself did. And something he ordered. And may Allah give us tawfiq to learn from these 10 days. That we, we went through over 10 days. And I was speaking to uh, the brothers, inshallah, what we are thinking of doing uh, is uh, very soon is do something on the seerah. I thought that would be better. Because we did say we want to start the life of the Khulafa, but we thought it's more other, more respect to start with the Prophet's life first. But you know, he's Uswatul Hassana, he's the best example. So we think at least for four, eight weeks, every once a week, for a few hours to go through the Prophet's life in, in one of the classical texts and to study his Shama'il, his behavior, and so forth. So we will do that. And with that, we, we pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with lesson. Do you have any questions at all? At all? Mahmoud, you know? Yes, mashallah. Ah, oh, that's a, that's a very. You mean Imam Hussein, yeah? No problem. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much for asking a good question, uh, which unfortunately I, I I should have covered at the beginning. Uh, what happened was. Uh, Umar bin Sa'ad read the funeral prayer of all of the people that uh, passed away on his side but all of the people that were martyred, the companions and the followers of Imam Hussein no one was allowed to read their funeral prayer it was prohibited then people from Banu Asad which was one of the tribes, local tribes they then came and then they did the janazah read the prayer over them and then they buried the Ahlul Bayt and they buried the martyrs of Karbala and another narration says that after this happened, when the Kufans heard that this happened, they came and they threw so much water on that area that they weren't even still happy that, you know, you know, even after burying them, even after killing them and humiliating them, they were still wanting to uh, uh, dig up the graves of these honorable people. So yes, uh, they were buried, but they were buried afterwards, after the armies of left. But they weren't buried by the Kufans, they were buried by the people from Banwasan. Imams, at that time, Imams, there's Muqtalib narration, some say early 20s. Uh, he wasn't he wasn't senior at all in age, uh, in, in regards to that. And he was a say, and, and that's one narration. But uh, that narration is a weak narration. Why? Because Ali al-Akbar, his elder brother was 19 years old. So it contradicts that. That's one narration that Kathir gives. The most likely he was, you know, he, he, he was going towards his teenager age, you know, years. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't, he wasn't either young. That, that is the reason when, when Shimmer looks at him, he says, look at him if, and find out whether he's a man now so we can kill him. Uh, and another thing, he had a quality, he looked more younger than uh, his actual age too. Radiallahu anhu. Only for Imam Hussein and his followers. So obviously they took in charge of the water. So they, they had access to the water, drinking the water for themselves, for the animals, for the horses. But for Imam Hussein they refused for three days. For that we're talking for the three days they refused from the seventh. Some narration says the full ten. But what we do know is that before that some of Imam Hussein's people didn't actually go and get the water from there. But then Umar, then what happened was Ibn Ziyad wrote a letter. I don't I don't remember if I can pick your mind uh, when you know when uh, Omar bin Saad sent the three proposals of what Imam Hussein wanted to do, and then he uh, when, when he agreed, he was going to agree to it, and then Shimon made him ch ch you know change his mind. When he sent that letter, he wrote under the letter too. He says prevent him to going prevent him from having a sip of water. 
treat him the way that the people treated Uthman bin Affan. And you know, that's the sixth thing they say. You, know, you don't represent Uthman bin Affan. If someone has right to Uthman bin Affan, he's the same. He was, he was, he was, he was his bodyguard outside his house. Ali radiallahu anhu wa ta'ala left Hassanin that he made to protect him. And it was Uthman that sent them all the way. And to now claim that you are somehow Marwan, even though they're related to each other, or even Muawiyah, that they have some right. It, it doesn't make sense. Muawiyah is different because he was a cousin and he's a Sahabi, and we respect him radiallahu anhu. But someone like Marwan has no right at all, you know. He, he's the cause. This is mentioned by Shah Abdul Aziz and Muhadis al Delhi, Rahmatullah alayhi. He says the cause of the killing of Uthman was Marwan. He says no one can deny it. And Shah Abdul Aziz says another thing in his Fatawa al Ziziyah and Tawfatul Ithmatul Asha, another book he wrote uh, in rebuttal to the people who believe in the 12s uh, groups. He says one of the conditions of loving the Ahlul Bayt is to curse Marwan. He says you can't be a lover of the Ahlul Bayt and not curse and even though some people try to praise him, may Allah protect him. Anything else? For us in Ahl Sunnah, well, Jum'ah is haram. It's not allowed. To bake is haram. Totally haram. There's no, there's no, uh, the Shia allow it according to their own fit. That's their law. That's their, you know, that's their way. We leave it to them. But for us, it's haram. Totally haram. We, the, ulama, the ulama give karaha. They say you should keep away from it. It's not haram because to be make something haram, uh, this is a point of wasool. One of the problems we have is, Everyone makes everyone into a kafir and to a Muslim nowadays. For example, uh, denying the sahbah of Abu Bakr is kufr. It's clear code. Not even the Shia don't deny it. They accept it. Abu Why? Because if you deny Abu Bakr's uh, sahbah and his, his companionship, you're denying the Quran. Thani thnaini idh huma fil ghar idh yaqoodi di sahibihi la tahazari in Allah ma'ala. It's in the Quran. Allah used the word sahibihi. So, that's proven from the Nasr Quran. If something's in the Quran to deny it becomes kufr clear put. To make something haram, this is a rule that you should understand. Haram can only be made by Allah and His Prophet. Apart from Allah and His Prophet, nothing that no one can make anything haram. You can make it makru, you make, and the makru was makru tahrimi, makru tanzihi. The Hanafi have two types of makru, minor and major. The Shafi is called makru makru, and the Malik is called dislike, dislike. And then you need evidences for that. For us, the, the fatawa that was given in al uh, and in uh, other books of fatawa Zahiriya uh, and other fatawa books that have been written, to pit and to watch it is karaha, is disliked. You shouldn't do it. It's not haram, but it's disliked. Let them say, brother, let them say whatever they want to be. Brother, if, some, if someone can murder Hussein, what, why should it shock us what a, a scholar says? If people could murder and violate Imam Hussein radiallahu anhu, have no fear of Allah, it doesn't matter what they say. Let them do what they say. You will be with those who you love on Yawm al If you love Yazid, you will be with Yazid. We love Hussein, we will be with Hussein radiallahu anhu. Finish. And uh, we don't support him, we don't like him, uh, we, we hate him. Uh, and you know, the, the, you know uh, it's, it's, it's the ayah of Mubalaha, you know, it's in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called Hassanin, Karima, and Fatima. It's an, uh, maybe another subject, another day, maybe a khutbah you could give on about, uh, you know, uh, about that challenge from the Christians from the Jirak. It's a beautiful area that you study how to profit that. Anything else at all? Uh, may Allah reward. Yes, Bismillah. Sorry, what was that? 
the ultimate lesson in my humble opinion is uh, re-evaluating how much love we have for his family I think the biggest lesson that we can all learn from Karbala is that one we shouldn't abandon the Ahlul Bayt because of other people and we should make these days to remember them and it shouldn't just be a day for 10 days we should remember the Ahlul Bayt throughout our life and also remember the Sahaba because we are what Ahlul Sunnah wa Jamaa wa we we don't love one over another we love the Ahlul Bayt the Ridwan Allah but at the same time we also love the Sahaba Ridwan Allah both the Ahlul Bayt and the Sahaba are our role models so we just don't, we, we love the Sahaba and we love the Ahlul Bayt and both for our role models. Uh, so I think the ultimate lesson is that sabr, patience, love, affection, familyhood, you know, being together as family, loving each other, knowing what a relationship between a father and son is and so forth. Anything else at all? May Allah reward you. Yes, sir. Just one last question. I just want to tell you all for myself. Yes, that's, that's been present over the last 10 days. Uh, I think we just want to show you gratitude uh, and thank you for this dua. This, 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 this is all reward of Imam Hussein. I, I, I did it so I get a reward, alhamdulillah. So, uh, I think the lessons that I think all of us have taken and learned from, from these 10 days have been massive, inshallah. I, I, I hope and pray that our perception of the other way will change. Uh, Inshallah, Jazakallah. Uh, may Allah reward you and may Allah, may Allah reward all of us. It's not my job, it's Brother Mahmoud, thank you to you, Brother Umar, the designers, everyone, what yourselves, brothers, everyone who came for every day, especially Asad and Awais has disappeared. Man. You know, Ubaid even, mashallah, came towards the end of it, which is a, which is a good thing to have, in the, especially having the young students, because it's, a lot of the stuff you say is maybe a bit too much for them, but to, for even them to come, it really reinforces that we have to work on our youth inshallah so we pray for inshallah let's do our prayer